Hello friends, uh, today we will be doing the current affairs for the 5th, sorry, uh, for the 5th of April 2022. Okay. Now, amongst the topics that we discussed today would be the Jagannath Temple because currently there is a bit of a controversy that's uh, revolving around the Jagannath Temple. So we'll discuss the Shivana temple in detail. We'll also, along with that, we'll discuss uh, the Nagara style temple architecture. And we'll also discuss uh, uh, the special different types of Nagara architecture. Like Nagara architecture is uh, made up of uh, further subdivisions like uh, uh, Odisha school of architecture or uh, at the hills, what is it? Uh, and then in central India, how is it different? And then in the eastern part of India, how is it different? So we'll discuss a little bit in detail uh, regarding Agra School of Architecture. We'll also do basics of uh, Dravidian School of Architecture. Also, the second topic that we'll discuss today would be uh, with regards to the new controversy that has erupted in uh, Karnataka, which is related to Halal meat. How is it different from Chatka meat? We'll do that. Also, we'll discuss uh, what are the various fundamental duties of citizens and how fundamental duties can be enjoyed by citizens only by performing fundamental uh, fundamental rights can be enjoyed only by performing fundamental duties also india is uh, announced that it would be making 108 military equipment this is in relation to the defense corridors that india has announced and also it's a part of atmanirbhar bharat uh, program so we'll do this as well and uh, the third uh, installment of the IBCC sixth assessment report has been released and it paints a very dire uh, picture for the world that we cannot achieve this uh, 1.5 degree or forget 1.5 degree we cannot achieve warming below 2 degrees of uh, pre-industrial revolution times so we'll discuss that as well so these four topics we'll discuss in detail uh, one. While the other two topics are more of the static nature. Okay. Now, ASI wants Odisha government to tweak beautification plan around Jagannath Temple. Why? The Archaeological Survey of India has asked the Odisha government to tweak its Sri Mandira Parikrama project, a massive beautification project around the 12th century Jagannath Temple in Puri. Now, why is it in controversy or why is the ASI giving out these uh, guidelines? It's saying that neither does the state government have the permission of the National Monuments Authority nor does it have the approval from the Archaeological Survey of India to plan and execute projects which could potentially pose a threat to centuries old temple. Now why is it necessary to get uh, their permission? Because as per Amasar Act, Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act no new construction can take place within a radius of about 100 meters of a monument which is treated as a prohibited zone and the area up to 200 meters is known as a regulated zone. The NMA, National Monuments Authority permission is compulsory for any construction. Okay. Now we had discussed this earlier because under section 4 of the Amasar Act, okay. Uh, ancient monuments and archaeological sites which are of historical importance or of artistic interest and have been in existence for not less than 100 years may be declared as monuments of national importance. And once they are declared as monuments of national importance, the protection and maintenance of monuments declared of national importance is taken up by the Archaeological Survey of India. So either they need the permission of the National Monuments Authority or they need the permission of the Archaeological Survey of India. Okay. Uh, that is because the Archaeological Survey of India regulates all archaeological activities in the country as per the provisions of the Amasar Act. Okay. Now, now what are the problems that have been raised by the Archaeological Survey of India? The Archaeological Survey of India says that the proposed amenities fall within the prohibited area of the temple. They fall within this 100 meters uh, range. The government was also requested to keep the entire design simple okay but the government odisha government has planned out a very elaborate design apparently okay and uh, this has fallen foul with the archaeological survey of india now what is the jagannath temple 
the Jagannath temple is believed to be constructed by the eastern Ganga king, who King Anantavarman, and it was constructed in the 12th century AD in Puri. Okay. Jagannath temple is called as the Yamanika Tirtha, which means that even the god of death cannot enter into it. The temple was called as the White Pagoda, which is the Black Pagoda. Please uh, check this out. It is the Sun Temple at Konark because of its magnetic properties. I'm sorry. Uh, so this was known as the White Pagoda and it's a part of the Chardam pilgrimages. Who established these Chardam pilgrimages? It was established by Adi Shankara of the Bhakti tradition, according to which there were four uh, dumps which were established, such as Badrinath, Dwaraka, Puri and Rameswara. So as a part of Puri, uh, at J Lord Jagannath temple, a dham was established. Okay, rather than it being uh, Rameswaram over here, it is more, it is better if you write it as Shringeri. Okay. So these were the four that were established. There are also four gates to the temple. Eastern Singha Dwara, which is for lion. Southern Ashwadwara, which means it is for the horse. Vyagra Dwara, which is the tiger entrance. And the Hasti Dwara, which is the elephant entrance. And there is a carving of each form at each gate. In front of the entrance stands the Aruna Stamba or the sun pillar, which was originally from the sun temple in Konark. Please remember this that the Aruna Stamba was brought from Konark to here. The Puri temple is famous for its annual Ratha Yatra or the chariot festival where all the three principal deities are pulled on huge and elaborately decorated temple cars. Who are these three principal deities? Lord Jagannath, Lord Balabhadra and Shubhadra. These are the deities who are pulled. And unlike the stone and metal icons found in most of the Hindu temples, the Jagannath temple's idols are made up of wood and they are replaced every 12 to 19 years. Please remember this. Okay. Now the architecture of the Jagannath temple. It is of the Odisha style of temple architecture. And it is one of the most magnific magnificent monuments in India. The huge temple complex covers an area of about 400,000 square feet and is surrounded by a high fortified wall. This 20 feet high wall is known as a Megananda Pacheri. Another wall known as the Kurma Beda surrounds the main temple which is the Garbhagriha. Okay, so you have one temple wall and you also have an inner temple wall within which you have the main shrine over here. Okay, now uh, we'll discuss a little bit of the Nagara style temple architecture. Okay, in India Majorly, temple architectures can be classified into Nagara, Dravidian, and Vesara. Okay, within Nagara style temple architecture, you have uh, some of the basic features of Hindu temples in India are the Garbhagriha, which is the shrine, or which is where the Lord's idol is kept. Okay, and then you have the Mandapa. which is the waiting hall for the devotees. It may also be known as the entrance to the temple. It has the space for a large number of worshippers and even dances and all of that they used to take place over here at the Mandapa. And then you have the Shikara or Vimana in the case of Shikara. In the case of Nagara and Vimana in the case of Dravidian, which is nothing but the huge uh, structure over the Garbhagriha which is like this either in the form of a pyramidical structure or in the form of a honeycomb. Apart from that you have an amalaka which is a stone like disc at the top of the temple and they are common in Nagara style temple architectures. Amalaka which means on top of this uh, shikara you have a stone disc like architecture Okay, and this is common in Nagara uh, style architecture. Okay. Apart from this you have a kalasha which means on top of the uh, on top of the amalaka you have a circular pot shaped thing okay and this usually contains water 
and it is used to bless bless the couples or bless the people with fertility it is the topmost point of the temple and commonly seen in again nagara style temples okay this is the okay this is the kalasha okay apart from that you have an antarala antarala is nothing but the transition area between garbhagriha and the mandapa okay and then you have vahana which is the which is the vehicle that is usually taken by the uh, temple's main god okay and also in uh, some dravidian in Dra dravidian temples you usually have a surrounding wall boundary wall okay boundary wall next you have dwarapalas in dravidian architecture who are the people who are guarding the garbhagriha and then in the case of nagara temples you have say statues of ganga or yamuna on the sides of the garbhagriha on the outside in the place of these dwarapalas in nagara temples you usually have ganga or yamuna or uh, you also have sometimes yaksha yaksha yakshini okay and also in dravidian style temples you usually have a temple pond so these are the various features of usually indian temples and when you talk about the classification of uh, nagara style temple architecture uh some of the classifications based upon the shikara type would be write it over here itself okay some of the classifications based on the shikara type would be latina or lake reka prasada latina or reka prasada and then one more type would be the famsana type and the last one would be the vallabhi type no This Latina or Reka Prasada is the most common type of shikara. It is square at the bottom, and the walls curve or slope inwards to a point at the top. Latina or Reka Prasada. It's like this. Okay, the walls are square at the bottom and they curve towards the top. And when it comes to famsana, okay, they are broader and shorter than the Latina type. Their roof is composed of several slabs that gently rise to a single point over the center of the building unlike latina ones which look like sharply rising towers okay so in famsana you have slabs okay and these slabs actually rise to a single point at the top okay okay next and these are usually shorter as compared to latina or reka prasada and in the case of vallabhi you have rectangular buildings with a roof that rises into a vaulted chamber okay it's like you have a rectangular base and the roof it is like some sort of a chamber actually it's a three dimensional thing okay and uh, within nagara style temple architecture you have different types of nagara temples in the central part of india and western part of india eastern part of india and the hills okay in the central part of india i am sure you must have seen kajuraho temple okay in kajuraho and then you must have seen the dashavatar temple in devgarh in up and then in the western part of india you must have seen the sun temple in modera gujarat that is an example of uh, nagara style and then in the eastern part of india you have different architectures such as the bengal architecture then you have the orissa architecture okay now within this orissa architecture we have sun temple jagannath temple and all of that okay now we'll discuss the orissa uh, style of temple architecture a little bit in detail because uh, since we're doing this right now okay uh, now <clears throat> in orissa type architecture also the temples are actually classified into three groups okay uh one is based on re one is the reka pida group and the other one is the pida dula group and the last one is the kakra dula group Reka 
पीडा गुरु सॉरी रेखा पीडा गुरु द अदर वन इज द पीडा ड्यूला गुरु पीडा ड्यूला गुरु एंड द लास्ट वन इज जगन्नाथ टेपल दिसमिड शेप्ड रूफ This is like Peter Dula. It's like you know. This will be more of the Konark style temple. Okay, and then Kakra Dula is more of a rectangular building with a truncated pyramid-shaped roof. Okay, and usually uh, temples of the female deities are in the form of a Kakra Dula. Okay, and these are very close to. Dravidian type uh, temples, okay, very close to Dravidian style. Okay, now, uh, pretty much this is what these are the basics of uh, temple style architecture, temple architecture. Uh, also, we'll discuss this in more detail in some other class. Okay, what is the halal meat controversy currently in Karnataka? After the hijab controversy, there is a new controversy known as the halal controversy, where uh, the government has passed an order saying that you need to stun animals before killing them, which means that you need to, at one go, you need to first stun them so that they don't feel the pain uh, before killing them or slaughtering them, and this goes against the religious beliefs of the minority community, especially the Muslims, because for them they believe in. this concept of halal meat which means that animal should not killed be killed at once rather they should be killed slowly what is halal halal is a arabic word meaning lawful or permitted and it is used to represent that meat which is made through the practices which are permitted in the quran okay usually halal foods are those that are free from any component that muslims are prohibited from consuming and processed or produced in accordance with islamic law Islam places a great emphasis on the way in which animals life is ended. The method of Islamic slaughter, commonly known as halal cut, is claimed to have been designed in a way that reduces the pain and distress an animal suffers. Though this is not entirely true, okay? The animal is killed by slitting the throat with one continuous motion of a sharp knife. Once cut, the animal must be allowed to bleed out and be dead completely before processing further. This process results in the least amount of suffering as when a cut is made swiftly. and cleanly the animal loses consciousness before the brain can perceive any pain the animal becomes unconscious within seconds and death occurs due to cerebral hypoxia now over here the animal is being made to bleed out and the blood is completely drained out blood is completely drained out okay while in the case of jatka the blood is not drained out rather there is one swift motion and the animal is cut or the animal is killed it is killed instantaneously there is no bleeding as such the word jatka is believed to have been derived from the sanskrit word jatiti which means instantly quick and this type of slaughter is preferred by sikhs as well as buddhists Jatka karna refers to instantaneous severing of the head of an animal with a single stroke of any weapon with the underlying intention to killing it with minimal suffering okay now why is it important in sikhism while not all sikhs maintain the practice of eating jatka meat it has been mandated by all the sikh gurus so the sikh gurus have supported jatka meat consumption according to sikh tradition the only meat that is obtained from an animal which is killed with one stroke of the weapon and causing it instant death is fit for human consumption guru gobind singh had also enjoined upon sikhs to abstain from halal meat introduced by the muslim ruling class why right? because sikhs were persecuted by the muslims at that point of time so that was also one of the reasons why the sikh gurus supported the consumption of jatka meat okay jatka meat 
now one more thing is that uh, please remember that Yeah, in the case of Jatka meat, the blood is still stuck in the arteries and the veins. And this some people suggest is not very healthy. While in halal meat, because the animal is being made to bleed out uh, fully continuously, there is no more blood left inside the animal that can be stuck in its veins or arteries. Okay. Now, next topic, fundamental duties of citizens. The Supreme Court of India recently asked the government of India to file an affidavit outlining the efforts it has taken or plans to take regarding the enforceability of fundamental duties. This comes after the Attorney General of India argued that the court should not direct the formulation of a legislation on the subject because the government is working to sensitize citizens and raise awareness about their responsibilities regarding the fundamental duties. Okay, now what are fundamental duties? The 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act introduced fundamental duties and this was introduced on the basis of the Swaran Singh Committee recommendations who borrowed it from the constitution of the USSR because it was believed that duties go hand in hand with rights and this was introduced in only one article known as Article 51A. Originally Part 4A consists of 10 fundamental duties but later through the 86th Constitutional Amendment Act which was related to right to education, the 11th fundamental duty was added. Now this 11th fundamental duty is nothing but who is a parent or a guardian has to provide opportunities for education to his child or ward between the ages of 6 to 14 which is guaranteed under the right to education. Okay. Now the fundamental duties are statutory duties and shall be enforceable by law. Unlike fundamental rights, they are non-justiciable. So only when they are enforced by law can they be implemented. Rather for their non-implementation, you cannot go to the court and say that my fundamental duties are not being implemented, so please give me justice. So they are non-justiciable. However, when the parliament creates a law, then they can be enforced. Okay. So for example, the Prevention of Insults to National Honor Act is an act of the Parliament of India which prohibits insults to the country's national symbols, national flag, national emblem, the national anthem, the constitution, and people can be booked on, under this. Okay, either if you insult the flag, the emblem, the constitution, or the national uh, anthem. Okay. Now, fundamental duties. What are the different fundamental duties? Okay. Uh, the different fundamental duties are to abide by the constitution and respect its ideals, to cherish and follow the noble ideals which inspired the freedom struggle. Okay, to uphold and protect the sovereignty, unity and integrity of India, to defend the country and render national service when called upon to do so, to promote harmony and spirit of common brotherhood amongst all people of India, transcending religious, linguistic and regional diversities, to renounce practices which are derogatory to women. Please remember this one. This is very important. You can write it in your main answers. That it is one of the fundamental duties. So people need to, you know, follow it. Now, uh, also, to value and preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture, to protect and improve the natural environment including forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife and to have a compassion for living creatures. Okay. To develop the scientific temper, humanism and the spirit of inquiry and reform, to safeguard public property and abjure violence, to strive towards excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity. Okay. Now what is the need for fundamental duties? They serve as a constant reminder to every citizen that while we get fundamental rights it also requires the constitution requires the citizens to follow some basic norms of democratic behavior okay now to maintain harmony and peace and in ensure the feeling of brotherhood and oneness as because india has people belong to different castes different religions etc it plays a vital role in upholding the sovereignty unity and integrity of the country which is inevitable which is of inevitable importance okay what are the other criticism what is the criticism of this uh, fundamental duties some of the duties are very vague like say for example okay what is this duty to develop scientific temper how will you measure this for one person it might be one thing for another it might be another thing there are no explicit provisions or sanctions pertaining to the execution and enforcement of fundamental duties okay now also because it has just been given as an appendage it is given in article 4 Plus sub a. Now, what value will it have? 
it has given an I'm sorry part 4 a I either it should have been given properly as a separate part okay it should not have been given as an appendage to the power DPSPs and that reduces its value in Atmanirbhar push India to make 108 military equipment if you have seen okay this infograph talks about the different structural reforms that India tried to roll out uh, under the Atmanirbhar project so under defense a list of weapons platforms for ban on import will be notified FDA limit in manufacturing under automatic route to be increased to 74 percent so these are some of the steps that have been uh, taken under this Atmanirbhar Bharat in a fresh MP test to its flagship Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhyan the central government will soon, soon start the indigenous production of 108 military equipment including complex uh, defense systems the list of the equipment that will be introduced indigenously include advanced defense gear and equipment including new generation of corvettes radars light and medium armored vehicles airborne early warning and control systems evacs medium range surface to air missiles anti tank guided missiles tank engines and more now indigenization of defense production what are the steps that the government has taken for indigenization of the defense production okay the central government has taken several policy initiatives under make in india program and brought reforms to encourage indigenous design development and manufacture such as the most recent one being this Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020 norms, which, which encourages indigenous production in India itself. We'll discuss this. To make India self-reliant, the Ordnance Factory Board was split up into seven, dif seven different companies from now on. So Ordnance Factory Board is now, it is a company. I mean, they are dif it is uh, split up into seven different companies in order to ensure proper working. These seven new defense PSUs are 100% government-owned corporate entities and will help in improving the country's self-reliance. Okay, apart from this, even the government has introduced something called as the Defense Industrial Corridor. Okay, these Defense Industrial Corridors have been introduced in both Uttar Pradesh and in Tamil Nadu. Now, the defense industrial uh, corridor of uh, UP or uh, the defense industrial corridor of Tamil Nadu has some features, okay. They have single window approvals, okay, and they have a Nivesh Mitra portal to ease the, uh, I mean, to ensure ease of doing business in, uh, in these defense corridor, okay. One is the Nivesh Mitra portal. And you have single window clearance for most of the permissions. Okay. Okay. And they'll have uh, assured water supply, uninterrupted electricity, connectivity with four lane uh, highways, and uh, proper labor permits towards flexible uh, employment, and all of that for these two uh, defense industrial corridors. Now, what is a defense corridor? It is a route or a path along which domestic productions of defense equipment by public sector, private sector and MSMEs are lined up to enhance operational capability of the defense forces. So any industrial corridor, like other industrial corridors, in the defense industrial corridor you will have defense establishments. Let it be private sector, let it be public sector or let it even be MSMEs. And these defense establishments will try to improve the defense capabilities of the country. Okay. It will provide a fillip to defense manufacturing ecosystems in India. Now, uh, we will uh, go into what are the items that are planning to be exported. India's defense exports have recorded nearly a six-fold increase between 2017 to 2021, growing from 1,500 crores to 8,400 crores. Look at the massive jump in the Indian exports. These exports are actually being uh, done through these defense exports. We have several defense expos, the major one being in uh, Uttar Pradesh and Lucknow. So because of these defense expos, India has been increasing its defense exports, like export of Brahmos to Vietnam, okay, and uh, export of uh, submarines like Jalashwa and all to Myanmar, okay. 
Now, defense items being exported by India include missiles, the advanced light helicopters, offshore patrol ves vessels, personal protective gear, surveillance systems, and a variety of radars. And can you see this? In the last four years, there has been a six-fold jump in the defense exports. This is only possible when you have higher amount of uh, defense investments. Like say FDA in uh, defense manufacturing has been increased to 74% through the automatic route, which means that foreign companies which are coming in, they can control a 74% stake in any of these companies. Let it be private or let it be public sector. Okay. Now defense acquisition procedure 2020, it has been established as a potential catalyst for the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. The new policy sub superseded the defense procurement procedure of 2016. Now, under this uh, defense acquisition procedure of 2020, we have these features. Okay, I have given them over here. Reservations for indigenous firms. The policy reserves several procurement categories for indigenous firms. Defense acquisition procedure 2020 defines an Indian vendor as a company that is owned and controlled by resident Indian citizens with foreign direct investment not more than 49%. Okay, so these uh, indigenous firms, they have several procurement categories which are reserved for them okay now please remember this and these indian companies or indigenous firms should not have fdi more than 49 percent which means that the majority stake of 51 percent li should lie with indigenous uh, entities resident indigenous entities okay uh, now there is a new category called by global manufacture in India. This stipulates the indigenization of at least 50% of the overall contract value of a foreign purchase bought with intention of subsequently building it in India with technology transfer. Greater indigenous content. It promotes greater indigenous content in arms and equipment of military procure of the military procures including equipment manufactured in India under license. In most acquisition categories, in most of the acquisition categories, not just in by global manufacturing in India. The defense acquisition procedure 2020 stipulates a 10% higher indigenization than DPP 2016. Let it be anything. Most of the acquisition categories have a 10% higher indigenous production. Okay. Now, import embargo list. The import embargo list of 101 items that the government promulgated has been specifically incorporated into the defense acquisition procedure. On these 101 items, India will not import them. Rather, they will ensure that they will be produced within India itself. Okay, we have also introduced this concept of offset liability. Okay, in the Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020, the government has decided not to have an offset clause in procurement of defense equipment if the deal is done through inter-government agreement or government-to-government -government or an ab initio single vendor. Okay, from the beginning, if it's a single vendor, only if it's a single vendor, or if it's an intergovernment agreement, you need not have an offset clause. What is the offset clause? Offset clause requires the foreign vendor to invest a part of the contract value within India. So this offset clause is being waived off in the case of intergovernmental uh, projects. Now this was waived off because of the Rafael controversy. Okay. Now what are what is this make category? How are we supporting Atmanirbhar Bharat? Make 1 refers to government funded projects, Make 2 refers to industry funded projects and Make 3 covers military hardware that may not be designed or developed indigenously but can be manufactured in the country for import substitution. Okay, The Indian firms will manufacture these in collaboration with partner firms. These are the different Make categories and these Make categories will help in indigenous development within India. Okay. Please remember this. Next uh, topic that we will discuss is Raja Ravi Varma. Why? Because one of his significant paintings, Draupadri Vastraharan, is going under the auction for the first time ever. Mr. Raja Ravi Varma was born into aristocratic family in Travancore Kingdom. And he went on to receive uh, training in watercolors from Ramaswami Naidu, who was the royal painter. He made around 7,000 paintings apart from painting Hindu mythological figures and he also made portraits of many Indians and Europeans. He worked on both portrait and landscape paintings and he was one of the first to use oil paintings. He continues to be regarded as the most important representative of the European school of painting in India. 
Okay, he also introduced this thing called as a lithographic press. What was the lithographic press? This helped in production of his uh, work or of his paintings. And uh, this lithographic press printed out cheaper versions of his paintings. And it could also be seen that they were oil paintings. And this made these paintings reach even common man's house. Lithographic press is a method of printing based on the principle that oil and water do not mix. Paintings were earlier sent to Germany and Austria. But he introduced the first lithographic uh, press in Maharashtra, in Ghatkopar and eventually in Lonavla. Through his printing press, Varma's paintings travelled into the homes of working class people. Some of the famous works of Raja Ravi Varma are Damayanti talking to a swan, Shakuntala looking for Dushyanta, Nair lady adorning her hair, Shantanu and Matsyaganda. So there are several other paintings I obviously cannot list it all over here. The British government gave him the Kaiserehin. Okay. And recently in 2013, a crater on the planet Mercury was also named after him. The IPCC third assessment, uh, the third installment of the sixth assessment report has been released. And uh, the IPCC has given a very stark warning in its third uh, installment. And uh, the UN Secretary General has said that currently whatever the various countries governments have done, it is a litany of broken promises. Because after reading this report, he believes that, you know, we are not going anywhere with climate change. And all the governments have just broken their promises. What is IPCC? It's a United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. It was set up in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization. Please remember this. And the UNEP. The UNEP itself was set up in 1972 based on the Stockholm Convention. And after that, the UNEP along with the World Meteorological Organization set up the IPCC. Now, what is this IPCC in 1988? Now, what is this IPCC? It is not there for uh, engaging in scientific research. Rather, it asks scientists from around the world to go through all the relevant scientific literature related to climate change and draw up logical conclusions. So, it's a grouping of scientists and they go through the material rather than they themselves or this IPCC itself engaging in uh, research. Its main activity is to prepare the assessment reports, special reports, methodology reports, assessing the climate change. And currently we have the sixth assessment report. Okay, uh, above in the infograph I have given the various uh, assessment reports that have been released along with the year in which they were released. First report was in the year 1990, two years after its formation. Second report was 95, third report was 2001, after that 2007, 2014 and again you can say that they were formed in uh, intervals of around say uh, 6 to 7 years. Okay. Every 6 to 7 years there was an assessment report. Now what are the features of this uh, new 6th assessment report? Okay, uh, sorry, before that we will see what assessment reports are. They are produced every few years are the most comprehensive and widely accepted scientific evaluations. When it comes to Earth's climate, they form the basis of government policies to tackle climate change and provide scientific foundation for the international climate change negotiations. Six assessment reports have been published so far. The first part of this sixth assessment report was published in August 2021. Okay, and it flagged more intense and frequent heat waves, increased incidence of extreme rainfall, dangerous rise of sea levels, prolonged droughts, melting glaciers and said that 1.5 degrees Celsius warming was much closer than what was thought earlier. And it is also inevitable. That means that whatever the country is do, you cannot avoid this 1.5 degrees warming as compared to pre-industrial levels. The second part of the report of uh, sixth assessment report warned that multiple climate change induced disasters were likely in the new next two decades, even if strong action was taken to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. Now what is the third assessment report? What are the key points? Temperatures on earth will shoot past a key danger point unless greenhouse gases emissions fall faster than countries uh, that have committed under the Paris Agreement. Unless and until you do better than that, the uh, temperatures will shoot past a danger point. Also the projected global emissions 
place limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees beyond reach and make it harder after 2020 uh, 2030 to limit warming warming to 2 degrees celsius so currently what are the governments are doing are clearly not enough unless countries step up their efforts the planet will on an average increase by 2.4 uh, degrees celsius to 3.5 degrees celsius by the end of uh, the century which means 2100 also 40% of the emissions came from europe and north america and over only 12% can be given to east asia including china china took over the position as the world's top emitter from united states okay now the authors have also given different ways in which uh, the temperature can be kept uh, below 1.5 degrees celsius such as removal of carbon dioxide and then pumping aerosols into the sky and then shift away from fossil fuels towards uh, renewable energy and financial support to poor countries and also one uh, move which is described as a low hanging fruit and which can be achieved by scientists it is to plug methane leaks from mines wells and landfills okay